threat. What should we call this maybe threat level with Bill Crystal? You know, I think we should call it. We are alarmed. (laughs) We are alarmed. We are very alarmed. We are increasingly alarmed. Something (laughs) like that. Hey, this is Tim Miller. I'm here with Bill Crystal, and we're going to break down today's biggest headline and the biggest threats that we're facing and the biggest things that Bill Crystal is alarmed about. And I assume number one is that we have now on day two with no speaker. I think I'm the person who says I am alarmed about every three days on yeah. Twitter and stuff. So I'm, I, I resent being out alarmed actually here by you, too. even though you're younger and more excitable than I am. You know, we, we old guys can be alarmed, very alarmed. So tell Unless me what you're alarmed, alarmed about. I'm, the chaos thing seems to be overstated. What's so chaotic? Patrick McHenry is this temporary speaker, and then they'll be they'll select some speaker. What I'm alarmed about is the actual outcomes of this, where the right wing will use uh, the will try to bludgeon the speaker candidates to commit to not not only not voting for aid for Ukraine, but not even bringing it to the floor. And I'd say so for me, the the actual outcomes here is what's going to happen over the next year. The most dangerous outcome could be, uh, you know, really damage the effort of the brave of the brave ukrainians ukraine is obviously the thing to be the most alarmed about i was listening to steve bannon's podcast this morning he's doing this victory lap uh he has nancy mace who was like a moderate republican supposedly a few minutes ago who's she's on an insurrectionist podcast this morning and uh and they were talking about what's next and the big takeaway from from bannon who who was a key agitator of all this right like the fox media was for kevin it was the even further right media that was agitating for getting rid of kevin and their uh consistent refrain is no money for ukraine no money for ukraine no money for ukraine so i just don't i don't know bill like you talk to those folks in the hill and you talk to ukraine folks a lot more than i do like I don't see how a Republican speaker that wants money for Ukraine can get 217 votes, 218 votes, whatever it ends up being. Um, I, what what are people saying about that? Well, but on the other hand, half the Republican conference is for continuing support for Ukraine. And some people are very committed to it. Can't they play the same hardball that the anti-Ukraine forces are playing? I mean, why could someone who's against aid for Ukraine get 218 votes? And maybe this, the obvious solution would be to have a speaker who says, look, I'm going to let it come to the floor. I, I won't put a thumb on the scale one way or the other or something like that. Um, so I, I but I, the pro-Ukraine people on the Hill, I was talking to someone about a couple hours ago who works this issue on the Hill. They need to play as much hardball as the anti-Ukraine people. They need to say, we're not voting for you. If you make a commitment to the anti-Ukraine people that you won't bring it to the floor, we want a commitment for you that you'll bring it allow a measure that passes the Senate first to come to the floor. You can vote against it, Steve Scalise, or whoever, but you can't block it from coming to the floor. Because there is a natural majority for helping sure. Ukraine. We haven't really seen that, right? Right. And I mean, I guess Mitch McConnell, I would not, a, not a ton of Mitch McConnell praise at the bulwark, but Mitch McConnell has been pretty stalwart on this, right? And, and has played hardball to a certain extent, uh, not getting yep. pushed around by the... Matt, excuse me, by the Matt Gates, Rand Paul, same, same, by the Rand Pauls of his caucus. Uh, but we haven't seen that really in the House. I, I do, you have reason to believe that those guys, whoever they are, Mike Gallagher of Wisconsin, and we always all say the same names, like that these guys would actually, you know, nut up on this? Yeah, Mike McCall. And the trouble is those guys are responsible and therefore don't like to blow up a speaker or have the House to set into chaos or threaten to vote for a Democrat for speaker. I mean, it gets back to something you've written about many times very, very well. The so-called Republican so-called moderates, A, they're not that moderate, some of them. They go along with the party as a whole, and and then the party as a whole gets held hostage by the right flank, and so the moderates are trooping along in the back, moaning and complaining and griping, but they don't ever quite say, hey, you know what? We can live with Hakeem Jeffries as speaker. I mean, five in the Shepard Press Conference tomorrow and say, we can vote for Jeffries as speaker, we would make clear as we do so that we're not going to be automatically support him on rules or legislation. So it will be like an independent caucus. But if Jeffrey says he'll bring Ukraine to the floor and if the Republican looks like he's not going to, why is that the end of the world? Are they passing any legislation that Biden's going to sign anyway? When you think about it for 10 seconds, it's sort of like that's a reasonable tactic for the responsible Republicans to use, which is kind of a hardball tactic. They're not really into hardball, though, Tim. They haven't been. So there's this guy, Pat Ryan, uh, in New York 18. I didn't know a lot about him, but he was out there today, Democrat, um, saying, I, you know, my, I'm issuing a challenge to five Republicans. Like, our, my door's open. Like, come talk. Like, maybe we can cut a deal, right, on some of these things. And, you know, I, usually I would dismiss that. 
as like fantasizing of the you know Bill Crystal Green Room class. You know, uh, am I in the Bill Crystal Green I'm, I'm Room? I'm kind class of into yet? the yeah, the fantasy, yes, various <laughs> forms of fantasizing. So that's good. Yeah, nothing wrong with a little fantasizing, but um, I, in this case. It's like okay, I, I, here's where here's where we are math wise. Let's just get people up to speed. So, so Steve Scalise of Louisiana said he's going to throw his name in the ring. Jim Jordan said he's going to throw his name in the ring. Some people said they're going to nominate Trump. I, I assume other people will emerge, right? So, you know, any any person, any Republican to win the speakership needs to get every, every Republican besides four, or they need you know to get Democrats, right? Uh, so. Uh, let's say that nobody can, I, you know, I, I don't think there's a clear path for Scalise or Jordan. Maybe they can. There's not a clear, clear path for either of them getting everybody besides four. And so, okay, well, you know, why couldn't there at least be some of those conversations? They decide to kick the can for a week. Wouldn't this be the time to flex some muscle, uh, you know, at least to f pretend, you know, go have a meeting, leak it to Politico, <laughs> you know, say we're thinking about this, right? Like, wouldn't this be the time for that? Yeah, totally. I mean, they first have to win the Republican conference sort of nomination for speaker, so to speak. But again, half the conference is for Ukraine. They have a lot of clout. It's not just five of them. Five of them could threaten to vote against the speaker on the floor. Right. Fifty of them could say in conference, we, again, you don't have to agree with us on Ukraine if you have a conscientious yeah. object, you know, view that, it's, that we shouldn't be helping them. Fine. But we need to be guaranteed a clear chance to make our case and to get a vote on the floor. All right. So besides that, it doesn't seem like you're that as alarmed as you have been about what's happening. And because you know, like these guys weren't going to do anything anyway. And like, as long as they fund Ukraine by the end of the year, it's like, who cares? Well, I don't know, what what do you do? think? I mean, how much does it, I mean, it increases the craziness, but the crazy, you know, as you and I have both said, uh, you know, if you, if you're if Donald Trump's winning your part, your party's nomination by 40 points and everyone in the party intends to basically support him for all of their griping and complaining and pretending to, to desert him for a while. And he's running even in the national polls with Joe Biden Man, that's 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 really alarming. That's more alarming than the House being dysfunctional for a few weeks. So Trump is more alarming than Steve, Steve Scalise, if you want to think of it that way. Yeah, I think that's right. Because I, I just, I, the, I, government shutting down would be bad. But it's not yeah. like they have other pressing issues, right? Like it's Ukraine and 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 getting the government running, you know, in forty two days, whatever, wherever it is. I don't. Here's another alarming thing for me that I was a little bit alarmed about, and that is this guy Patrick McHenry. You know, this wee little fella. So anytime you ask anybody, like, who are the rational people in Congress? Right? Like, anytime you call a Republican friend, you're like, who are the rational ones that you can, like, have a conversation with? Maybe they aren't where we are on Trump and on whatever. But, like, who who's left that's not in the Boebert, you know, Gates weirdo world? McHenry's name is, like, one of the first ones that people mention, right? And he is up there. He, he becomes speaker pro, tem, pro, uh, speaker pro tempore and um, pro tem. And like he's banging that little gavel like an angry leprechaun. And the first two things he does is like take away Nancy Pelosi and Steny Hoyer's offices, and it's like really petty, weird thing that like doesn't make sense to anybody who's not in, you know, like Fox World, who like doesn't even understand what Stan Nancy Nancy and Steny did wrong. It's like why are you punishing them? It's like Matt Gates was the reason that you lost your job, right? Like. Uh, so to me, that's a, that's like a little alarming, right? That it's like the that that you would think that McHenry would be the type of person that would come in and kind of calm things down and say, "Let's cooler heads prevail." Doesn't seem like there's a lot of momentum on the cooler heads prevail in the Republican world. I mean, everything has moved so far that McHenry, who was considered an institutionalist and sort yeah. of a you know, uh, as you say, not a hothead. I don't know why I did this. To, just to, because McCarthy was annoyed at the Democrats for not saving him from Matt Gates. I mean, really, was that the Democrats' job to do? You know, <laughs> McCarthy is the guy who agreed to a deal that you get a motion to vacate with one not, person making the motion. He, he, they had previous proposals the Democrats had, had made, and I think it was the rule even under Pelosi that you needed more than one person on a motion to vacate. So yeah, uh, yeah. So what they're supposed to now save him, and then they don't save McCarthy, who's broken his word and it's been terrible in a million different ways. And then the punishment is to take away Pelosi's and Hoyer's little uh, offices in the Capitol. McCarthy now they're giving that the office to the office is now being given to McCarthy Pelosi's office, right? And then the which is I feel bad. Who for is that nobody? Well, what, why is she McCarthy? McCarthy is just a congressman from Bakersfield now. He that's pretty well. Pelosi's just a 
member of Congress from San Francisco, but that's that, that's like a pretty big downgrade for that office to go from Pelosi, one of the most successful and important speakers in modern American history, to Kevin McCarthy, the shortest had the shortest term as speaker in, in modern American in modern American history. And then I guess I don't just sell the guy with tuberculosis short. Okay, eighteen seventy six. He had a he had a very well. He's a slaver, but he had a strong eight months. Yeah, I mean, yeah I, I'm sure. And then I heard just a little while ago that um, some of McCarthy's top staff are making calls for Jim Jordan, not for Scalise. Maybe McCarthy and Scalise don't like each other. That's often the case of number one, number two. I mean, so much of this is like a dumb high school election, of course, you know, where there are all these petty feuds and rivalries. But it is. But the, the degree of, of, of just routine radicalism, I think that's the point about Patrick, routine uh, incivility, routine just, you know, we're going to get points on Fox for trashing. She's like, what did Nancy Pelosi do? She and Hoyer have been out of power for since they, they didn't, didn't even vote. Nancy actually, it actually actually helped Kevin because she was at and, the funeral. And Nancy Pelosi li- is in San Francisco as we speak yeah. at Diane Feinstein for Diane Feinstein's funeral. So she's out of town even. And, yeah. and he does this. Kevin needed uh, like the, 10 doesn't even think to be out of town. McKenzie doesn't even think it's more appropriate to wait till she gets back from Senator Feinstein's funeral. Right. Yeah, no, and she has stuff in the office. And the whole thing is just so petty and, and, and mean. I, two, two, two responses to that. Uh, one is just like on this whole notion that like uh, that uh, Republicans have convinced themselves that people are going to buy this, like the, this is the Democrats' fault thing, uh, which, is, uh, which is just you can only think this if you're in your weird bubble where everybody, you know, tells you that you're, you know, you're the victim all the time. But uh, Mitt Romney, God love him. Um, I don't know if you saw this. Uh, he was asked about that theory that the Democrats should have saved him uh, and in the Senate today. And he said, I think Speaker McCarthy made a decision to get as close as he possibly could to the radical wing of his party. And by doing that, he made it virtually impossible for Democrats to come to his aid. Well, no shit, Mitt. Once <laughs> again, you know, just speaking the truth. Uh, so I just think that's like the reality of all this. Like Mitt is, again, all, it's all these other guys always are like, I was so offended that Mitt Romney was attacked personally during the 12 campaign, and that's why I have to be for Trump. And Mitt is like, what are you guys talking about? That was all, po- that's just politics. You know, like, we we don't have to go to the radical side. You know, he, he continues to be, the, like, the voice of reason and decency in the party. The other thing about this Jim Jordan McCarthy thing, I hadn't heard that, that you said that McCarthy people are calling for Jordan. Like, Jordan is a lunatic. Like, Jordan is a conspiratorial lunatic. I'd like to, to go say what you want about Boehner and Paul Ryan and even McCarthy. Like, I, you know, we are just defying, we're just going downwards in, in the quality of the speaker, the, the quality of, of how attached they are to reality. I and mean, Jim Jordan has been the point person on all of the crazy Hunter Biden conspiracies, uh, you know, shutting the government down, not funding Ukraine, right? Like the idea that this person would be speaker is crazy. And if this whole theory of the case is that McCarthy was the institutionalist, Democrats needed to, needed to have McCarthy around, I not it doesn't seem like really, right? Like it seems like the, these guys, the, there's a lot less daylight between Cart McCarthy and Jordan and McHenry than they want people to think i mean like to me it's like they're all kind of jim in jim jordan steve bannon world like what's the, the none of them are demonstrating that they're any different i mean jordan starts having hearings about biden and whether and whether you know pro pre-impeachment hearings and sure enough mccarthy says okay i'm authorizing an impeachment inquiry i agree with all this mccarthy's the alleged moderation of these semi-moderate types like mccarthy and he's not moderate but the alleged better than the conspiratorialist types they're a little better because they're not themselves insane conspiratorialists, uh, but they are, they certainly go along with them and they certainly don't punish them and don't, don't disown them and, and, uh, curb them. So, yeah, so I, I totally agree. Here we are. It, it is, yeah, it's very revealing. So we're alarmed about Ukraine. We're alarmed about Jim Jordan. Um, my last thing that I want to ask well, you about say, is, well, do you think, yeah. who do you think becomes speaker? So, I mean, and do you think Trump weighs in and maybe supports Jordan. That's one thing that occurred to me. Scalise would seem to be like the normal institutionalist like winner, you know? Yeah. But does Trump have an interest in this or not really? I mean Trump, you know, did put his thumb on the scale for Kevin, kind of. You know? Um so maybe Trump loves Trump is a messy bitch who lives for drama. Um so does, you know, so he likes being in the middle of stuff. Right. Uh, so I, I wouldn't I, I don't know. I don't want to predict, but I think I, I could see him getting involved. Uh, to me, I just think that Jordan, I, I, I would love to be wrong about this. This isn't really just a prediction so much as an instinct. I would love to be wrong about this. But, but to me, the whole th- theme of this conversation is 
the quote-unquote normal, quote-unquote moderate Republicans always seem to be happy to go along to get along with the crazy, and the crazy is unwilling to go along with any sort of decency or decorum. And so to me, it's like if Jim Jordan gets in there and gets 200 votes, I kind of think that the normal ones will go along with it in the end, and it ends up being Jordan. I, like To me, I think that Jordan is is more likely. I think Scalise... Anybody more, you know, people have thrown out Tom Emmer, who runs the NRCC, who's just like a more milquetoast McCarthy. No way. You know, to me, it's like, I guess I'd say Jordan most likely, Scalise next. And then next, it might be trying to figure out a crazy, like, middle solution, uh, which I don't, I'm very, I'm very pessimistic about, but I, I don't, I don't know that it's impossible. Interesting. Do you disagree with any of that? No, I guess I slightly, I don't know. I mean, no I think more. you're right. You've always been good at seeing the dynamic of the craziness and how it gets crazier and stronger. That's the terrible yeah. thing in yeah. the Republican party over the last seven years. That is really, it's not just that they're, gee, they're a lot of wackos out there, that they are more and more powerful in the party. There seems to be more and more of them. And that suggests that the conventional wisdom, that you know, Scalise, he's the number two, he's got yeah. good relations with all parts. He's very good at helping them, you know, helping them do whatever their little chores are on, during the day and stuff and blah, yeah. blah, blah. Yeah, that could well be overwhelmed by a kind of Jim Jordan, let's let's go crazier. Uh, yeah. sentiments. You know, Bill, I just wanted to check your threat level on one other thing. I wrote about this earlier this week. Mike Davis is a is a MAGA um, you know, figure, is a former uh, political staffer that now is a commentator in, in MAGA world, big Trump supporter. And and he uh said on an interview this week that if he was acting attorney general, you know, he would conduct all of these extra anti-constitutional illiberal laws like deporting 10 million people, including anchor babies who are here legally and, uh, you know, putting people that they don't like in Gitmo and all kinds of other crazy nonsense. You know, again, no, we're not seeing any pushback about any of that. You know, um, there's not any, there doesn't seem to be any blowback from from institutional Republican world, I, you know, so to me, that is the thing that when you put all this stuff together, I worry that, you know, there's nobody, there's nobody there to put the brakes on any of this. So I just I wonder where you land on that. No, I, I totally agree. I mean, that piece you did on Mike Davis was really excellent. And it's worth pointing out just what, I mean, he was a Grassley aide and he's been an aide and other, for other members of Congress. Gorsuch and, uh, and Bush, he worked for Bush. Yeah, and so, so he himself, the radicalization, I don't know him at all, but the, the radicalization of him, the kinds of things he's now routinely saying about what he would do if he could get into the Justice Department for a while is itself very indicative of, of a lot of people, you wrote about this in the book too, but I mean, a lot of people, the direction in which people are going and the speed with which they're not going towards real authoritarianism, I'm even going to call it, you know, quasi or semi-fascism in some respects. Uh, it really, and, and they, they're not repudiated by anyone that I can see and they're respectable figures in the new MAGA establishment. The other thing I would say, and I think you had this in the piece just in passing, uh, but it's worth, uh, I think he says, I'm going to do an unbelievable amount of stuff in the Justice Department and maybe I'll leave just after a few months or a few weeks or a few months, but you know, I'll know I'll get pardoned or he says this kind of just casually. Yeah. Yeah. The Trump pardon thing, when I thought about this, is really important. Now, think about this. you got a bunch of semi-fanatics in there. They want to destroy the deep state, imprison everyone who's, uh, you know, whatever, you know, uh, et cetera. I, mean, I wouldn't even go into it. And and if they know that in break, they, they get counsel, you can't do that. That's beyond the law. That's beyond the Constitution. You don't have the authority to do that. You can't fire these people. They're civil servants. They have protections. It takes 120 days, blah, blah, blah. They ignore it all. They break a million laws. They know that Trump is with them and Trump sitting there in the White House just starts pardoning all of them and really tells says ahead of time he'll pardon them right. and does pardon them in real time. It's not like he even waits till the end of the term or anything like that. Think of that dynamic, uh, you know, authoritarians with the promise of a pardon. That's very dangerous. Okay, well, we're going to keep doing this threat level check with th threat level check with Bill Crystal is, uh, is my tentative title. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> 